What's going on, everyone? And welcome in to this edition of Be Shafe Daily Live. It is Friday night. We're partying with our party people, and the St. Louis Cardinals are victorious in game one of the series out in the desert. Nine to six Cardinals over the Arizona Diamondbacks tonight after the Cardinals race out to a six nothing lead. Steven Matson, Giovanni Gallegos kind of sorted a little bit, gave it back, but the Cardinals were not done there, mounting a charge late with the inning that had Brendan Donovan's triple and Paul Goldschmidt coming up with a big swing to drive him in. You had the young guys in the eighth inning coming up with a nice little rally of their own at the bottom of the order for a little insurance, the type of insurance that, let's be honest, Ryan Helsley just doesn't need right now. He was lights out. JoJo Romero lights out. Andrew Kittredge lights out. A lot of good things to like about it. What did you like best, Cardinals fans? Get them in into the live chat if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're watching on the next day on YouTube, you're listening on YouTube, you're listening on Spotify, get those comments into the comment section and get those likes on this video. I'm going to basically just jump right in. Y'all know what happened. We all saw it. Newpar returns, hits a homer. Nolan Arenado hits his first home run since August 19th of 2023. He needed it. He needed it. He needed it. And if you out there are somebody who watches the videos I do or the podcast, you listen to them, maybe a radio show. I swear, at least once within the last like three or four days on one of the different like videos I do, I don't know if it was with Charlie Marlowe or I did Locked On Cardinals today. I, I, I think I might have said it on there, but I know it was not the first time I said it. I said something to the effect of get these NL West boys out to the desert, these former NL West guys, Arenado and Goldie, and I think you might see him start to, to hit some nukes. And Arenado broke out of it, folks. He had not had a power swing in a while, but we saw just a mammoth home run from Arenado to get the party going tonight for the Cardinals. He had some other really good swings as well. Has Arenado kind of returned to with just this one game? I know it's one game, but with with a, what was it, a three for five effort and obviously the three run homer. In your mind, how are you feeling about Arenado after a night like tonight that maybe is one that can get him right? Uh, how do you feel about the bottom of the order? Guys like Jordan Walker, man, one of the most impressive swings of this game to me was Jordan Walker's, the double that he hit before he was taken out for Michael Ciani as a pitch runner. Takes a ball lower away and drives it. I guess you can call it opposite field. It was to center, but it was right of center. So he's just taking that ball where it's pitched and driving it in the air. That's a pretty spacious outfield there in Arizona. So, it, you know, not a home run, but man, was it a nice swing and, and one that might, you know, if Cardinals fans see more of that from Jordan Walker, I think they're going to feel pretty good. So I'm going to take a quick sip of some water and then we will be off and running reading your comments. Really nice start to the road trip for the St. Louis Cardinals. Trevor is in. Hunter says, great win. This is a game where last year's team rolls over and gets it out and it gets out of hand. Credit to the lineup in the bullpen for grinding it out the last four innings to get the W. Yeah, it was one of those deals where fifth inning, they tie the game, and you're like, how, how did this just happen? The Cardinals were cruising, scoring runs in each of the first three innings. They're up 6 nothing, and then it's gone. You know, Steven Matz sort of hits the wall. They decide that, hey, the answer is going to be Gallegos in the spot. It wasn't. He gives up the three-run homer. Credit to Gio. Like, I, I I talked about Romero, Kittredge, Helsley. Those guys were electric tonight, combining for three scoreless innings, hitless innings, walkless innings, five combined strikeouts for those guys up, across the three frames that they pitched. Give a little bit of credit, though, to Gio, because after the home run, he did really settle it in. He pitched a sixth inning that the Cardinals absolutely needed to be scoreless. They needed to have that happen, and it ultimately does. Now, obviously, Steven Matt's line looks a little bit different. The ERA is still pretty sterling. It's at 1.80 because you have the error that contributes to the run scored against him. So only one of those four runs that was ultimately charged to Steven Matz uh, was actually against Steven Matz in terms of being an earned run. So, you know, take that for what it is. It is kind of interesting. And the Cardinals make a couple errors in this game. It is interesting that Steven Matz, you can make an error as the pitcher, but then it's like, well, if that run should happen to score, well, you know, we, we don't need to worry about that. But, Geo doing his job in the sixth inning is something that shouldn't be overlooked in this game. And the rest of the bullpen absolutely grinded out, allowing for the offense to sort of take its time and do what it needed to do to get to get this thing going. So nine to six Cardinals win. Impressive one. Travis says a lot to like from tonight's game. Another solid, uh, solid start by Mats. And I would say that that's fair. Again, it, 
with the way it went on, uh, kind of unraveled on him in the fifth inning, it's really then Geo that comes in and it gets a little bit. You can take that from Matt's, right? It's one bad inning. It's it's an error that contributes. I think it's one of those things that you can at least, if you watch the whole the first four innings and how he was kind of cruising and and doing just fine, you maybe aren't as concerned about the way that it unraveled a little bit at the end. So, uh, and again, the ERA looks nice. Like to get him through five, but again, I said fifth inning redacted in my tweet for a reason. Um, maybe we just we just shouldn't talk about it. Travis though also mentions uh, Newt, which was which was obviously great to see him with the power swing that he had. Goldie looking more comfortable. Arnado obviously doing so. Seven, eight, nine in the order, and uh, well, he says in the in the bullpen are locked in, which was true. I would say give some credit to what happened at the bottom of the Cardinal lineup as well with the seven, eight, nine spots. Walker win Victor Scott. That is fun, man. It's you might look at the batting averages and say, well, I don't know how fun it is. Walker's been struggling. Victor Scott, but Victor Scott gets a hit tonight. He gets the other swing that won't show up in the box score in terms of his batting average. Shows up in the box score because he got an RBI. But the sacrifice fly to go ahead and plate another insurance run there late. A nice night by Victor Scott. And man, is that good to see? And we talked about it. The bounce back. The fact that the Cardinals said, look, Wednesday, that's going to be the worst game he'll ever play. It's just one of those things that happened, but it doesn't have to define him by any means. And I understand there's a lot of people out there who would say, hey, the Cardinals need to send this guy down. I heard a lot of it Wednesday. I heard a lot of it Thursday. And I said, not for me. I want to see more of this guy. And honestly, in particular, I want to see how he bounces back after the worst game of his career. Like, I don't know. He's probably had a game in the minor leagues where he struck out four times or something. But what happens at the big leagues is what we're really talking about. And when you're on that stage and you make the mistakes that he made in terms of the stuff he's supposed to be good at, fielding, base running, he had some some faux pas in that game on Wednesday. Objectively, it cost the Cardinals the game. But how do you make sure that doesn't define you? You say, yep, get on the plane, kid. We're going to take you to Arizona. We, we understand Newpar's coming back. Don't you sweat it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to show a little bit of faith in you. And he goes back and has a good game tonight. I'm not. Let's not get carried away. It's not like he went three for four. He didn't go three for five like Nolan did, but a one for three with also a sacrifice fly mixed in. Man, that's a, you like seeing that. You like seeing that. Um, Good defense as well. And Mason Wynn, by the way, played good defense tonight too, other than the one throw that he, it was a high chopper. I think he felt like it was almost like a double clutch almost. And then when he threw it, um, hell of a play by Goldie to be able to catch the ball. He was like a cat jumping into midair for that one. Uh, But that is what it is. Mason having another really good day offensively. It's just happened for Mason Wynn. He's two for four. He had to triple. It's so fun to watch him run. His OPS now is up to 803. So you're starting to have a little bit more on the slug. Uh, This guy's batting eighth in this lineup. Again, you can see the bits and pieces come together. Brendan Donovan, he's going to be one of the best leadoff hitters in baseball by the time it's all said and done. I really think that's possible. You're talking about a potential all-star campaign. I I, I think when I did the bull predictions preseason, that was what I said, is that you'll get an all-star season out of Donovan. Three for four, a couple of runs scored. He's got stays healthy, man. That's the kind of guy that if the middle of the order is doing his job, Brendan Donovan scores 100 runs. He probably hits 15 home runs. He probably gets a decent number of RBIs if you can see guys like Wynn and Victor Scott at the bottom of the order getting on base for him because he'll hit for some power. He'll get on base. He's hitting 298 right now with a 967 OPS after the game that he had. Had a strikeout looking late as well, but whatever. I, I, think, I thought that was a little bit off the plate. But nevertheless... Like, Brendan Donovan's looking really locked in for this team. So, I don't know. Yeah, you still got a, a 188 average for Paul Goldschmidt, who did have a big swing, the go-ahead run. Walker's hitting 171. You know, Victor's hitting 106. It's, you know, th- those are some of the averages. Gorman's only hitting 212. It's part of reality. But, man, you can kind of see it come together a little bit, can't you? A little bit. I'm not saying it's just going to happen this way and the offense is now going to score you nine runs a game. But it's not. It's nights like tonight where you can kind of see maybe what they could be cooking with running on full cylinders and getting new bar back is a, is a step that should not be lost in that equation of the cylinders are now firing in a little bit of a different way. And they had him down in the sixth hole in the lineup, but I didn't mind it. You know, I think you could go a number of ways with large new bar in the order. You could go Donovan new bar. I know left, right, left, right, whatever, screw it to have those two guys bat at the top of the lineup. The two hole could be a spot for some power, some on base. I think new bar could be a nice combo of that. Yes, I know you may not want to stack the righties, uh, Arenado and, and Goldschmidt in whatever order you do, but that could also be something productive. Maybe go Gorman five, maybe go Wilson six, whatever it is. They've got now that one through six, whatever the order ends up being, they've got some real quality there. 
And then to think about the fact that the rest of the lineup, which was seven, eight, nine tonight, Walker, Wynn, Scott, those are the guys that produced the rally in the eighth inning. This is kind of what it should be for this Cardinal team. You won't score nine every night. But when I said at the beginning of the year and every podcast in the offseason, hey, for the Cardinals to really work the way they are designed, I think this needs to be like a top six, top five offense in baseball. I think it can be a top 10 offense in baseball. I wasn't convinced it could make that extra leap. The early returns of the first couple of weeks told me it may be good to pump the brakes on the idea that they're going to be anywhere sniffing the top five. But right now, game like tonight, don't get carried away. But if they're able to kind of compound this a little bit, it could be more fun to watch this team. Granted, those are the moments where maybe the starting pitching starts to go. You know that you have to have all elements working in sync at the same time. But it was kind of fun to watch what this team was able to do tonight, even when they had a little bit of adversity. You have an error, you have some runs, they have a big inning against you. Okay, what do you do about it? Well, they answered that question pretty definitively over the final innings of this game. Make sure to hit subscribe on the channel if you'd like to jump into the YouTube live chat and hit like on this video. 21 likes is something, but I bet it's not as many as 25. So let's make that happen. And yeah, Travis, that was the comment. I just like went on a rant of Ollie sticking with Victor Scott, I think was the right call. It really wasn't Ollie because that's something that Moselak could have pulled the trigger on and didn't. So credit to both those guys. Um, Ollie wants him here. There's just no doubt about that. Ollie want, has has stunned for Victor Scott. And he. why wouldn't you want him here with the defense that he plays? If you're a pitcher on this team, why wouldn't you want him here? Um, and then offensively, again, he's hitting 106 and he's he's scoring runs. He's driving in runs. Like he's very... There's a lot to like about this kid. I understand that it, it hasn't looked good in the box scores. A couple more games, that could be a thing of the past. I don't, again, I have not had the opinion that he's just been overmatched all the time. Are there some at-bats where you go, eh, that was ugly? Sure. How many of those has Nolan Gorman had? How many of those have Nolan Arenado had? Paul Goldsmith had? These guys are are veterans of the league or up-and-comers in the league. Jordan Walker, like, I, it has not been unique to Victor Scott. It's just the batting average was worse for him and the strikeouts a little bit higher than than not all of them. Like, some of those guys had struck out far more than Scott. But for a rookie, you look at that and go, okay, I'm not so sure this is, like, very sustainable. But at the same time, I think you're in a spot now where you go, you know what, this is, have a few games like this, and suddenly you can just take a, take a little deep breath and go, hey, it's not maybe so bad. This kid can at least get you through until Edmund and or Dylan Carlson gets back. And again, there's a world in which he just takes off and he kind of does what Mason wins doing where Mason had that little bit of time last year, kind of got a taste for what it was. And then he comes back this year and he looks like a different guy offensively. I'm not saying that Victor Scott's just going to magically do that from the beginning of April to late April. And suddenly he's going to be a different guy, but you'd be, a, you'd be amazed at a few things that can happen when balls start to fall in and, and you start to get some luck going your way. Um, he feels like a momentum type of player that can ride that he's fun in the lineup. So um, I don't know. I've been, you know, outspoken. I'm, I'm kind of, it's not like I'm going down with this ship, but I've said, look, I think the Cardinals are going to be at their best when they have a guy like Victor Scott playing center field. And until a Tommy Edmond gets back, they don't have another guy like Victor Scott. Um, and, and there are things Victor Scott can do that Edmond cannot do when it comes to having some upside at the plate. And, and even on the base running situation, like I think he can be a little bit more than Edmond in that area. And Edmond's pretty good. Edmond's got a lot of speed. Anyway, Allison, late night live stream. Excited to hear your takes on the game and all the youngsters. Yeah, the youngsters was, I mean, just watching through that late inning rally, I'm just like Jordan Walker with such a great swing. And you see what Mason Wynn can do. And then Victor Scott doesn't have to do too much. It's situational hitting. He's been able to do it a few times, and the batting average doesn't give you credit for it, but it's stuff that matters. It leads to directly to runs, which is, I mean, that's what it's all about. So. Trevor said, starting to get a little worried about Geo's confidence, but stacking series W's is the name of the game. Should have split versus LAD, choked the series against Philadelphia, which they did. So winning game one here is big. They, they're they going to want to not mess around with this one. It'd be nice for them to get a sweep at some point, but you're right. If you keep winning series, you're going to be okay at the end of the season. Uh, thank you, Allison, for liking and retweeting. Yeah, I, I did tweet this out at BSHA for 12 if y'all want to go and, it's, and it doesn't make you kick off the stream. If you're on your phone, then don't worry about it, but... If you can retweet my tweet about the stream, maybe more people will see it. I uh, appreciate you guys for doing that. Make sure to subscribe. The button's right there. It's right next to uh, my hat rack. So please click it if you enjoy Cardinals content on a daily basis. And you can ask the longtime listeners of the of the podcast of the channel. It really is a daily basis. I have gone, I'm pretty sure, I don't know, 15, 16 days in a row now, ever since like the day after the opener, 
of putting content on YouTube and Spotify. So Be Shape Daily finally living up to the name in 2024. I'm here for it. You should be too. Craig says some brews and a dude talking Cardinal baseball. Let's get it. Yeah, dude. The only problem is I'm not drinking a brew. I wish I was, but I, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm having water. It just feels like, I don't know. It just feels like it get, could get out of hand on me real quick. I'm not saying I'll rule it out forever, but for the time being, we'll stick with water uh, for the stream. Kittredge looking very much worth the trade value. That's from Hunter. Let me say something about the Kittredge trade. There's all this conversation about the guys that Mosaic has let go, and it's fair, right? Jordan Hicks looks like a legit starter. Why didn't the Cardinals let him be one? Tyler O'Neill, we knew was going to do what he's doing in Boston. We knew he would. It, it's not like anybody should be surprised like this. We saw it coming, right? If he could stay healthy, it's a very simple equation. Tyler O'Neill plus healthy equals MVP candidate. It just wasn't ever, it, it wasn't happening in St. Louis. wasn't likely going to happen in St. Louis. You can talk about the reasons for that until the cows come home. And we may at some point. But today the Cardinals won, so we're going to let that go. But what I wanted to say was there are or I should say there is a style of trade that John Mozeliak is really good at, and it's trading a bench player that's a little superfluous on the roster or not entirely necessary to the team and getting a pretty damn good relief pitcher out of that player. Palacios for Kittredge, even if Palacios turns out to be a solid get for the Rays, is a good trade for the Cardinals the way it's looking right now, and Kittredge is just nasty. It's like he's throwing wiffle balls out there, and I'm telling you his motion is a nice guy to have in a bullpen. Because you want to have guys that give different looks. You want to have guys that provide different arm angles and things like that. Because if you go seven, eight, nine, and everybody's a little bit different, you got JoJo pitching from the left side. You got Kittredge in the weird delivery. You got Helsley in this little thing called 101. It's pretty good. It's a pretty good mix. And so I think that's part of what is allowing the bullpen to be effective. But even though Gio gives up the bomb tonight, had the sixth inning, want to credit him for that. And tonight doesn't take away the fact that Luke Voigt for Gio Gallegos, I believe that was the trade. Uh, Chase and Shreve was also in that deal. That's another one from John Mozeliak that's like, you're trading a guy that was superfluous. Luke was never going to have the chance here. And you get Gallegos, who's been in the bullpen for like five years. It's a pretty good deal. Those are the kinds of trades that Mozeliak can do that I think Cardinals fans, when the, when the deal happens, you can look and go, all right, I'm trusting that that's probably a move that they know what they're doing with that. Kittredge, I think when the move was made, it was like, okay, we can be mad about the, oh, no, it's the next Adolis Garcia. Or it's like, you know, they got Palacios for 100 k from, what was it, the Guardians, and they're going to flip him and turn him into a, a guy that's got veteran experience in the bullpen. You know, I know it's the Rays, so I understand people might go, well, that means he's probably, you know, he's cooked and they, they can't lose a trade. Well, I think the Cardinals did what they needed to do in that deal. I mentioned the Gallegos deal and another one that really is looking solid and God bless him. But Emundo Sosa was not going to provide the value to this team that, that Jojo Romero currently is. There's just no world, no world in which that was going to happen. Even if you were here to be the backup shortstop to win, maybe you don't sign Crawford. You save a few million bucks, whatever. Jojo Romero is really, really important. If the Cardinals are going to be good this year And Keenan Middleton. Yeah. Travis mentions Keenan. Uh, hopefully he and, and Kittredge can stay healthy. They're going to need Keenan. It would be really nice for them to get him back. Um, Trevor hates Mo, but he's even giving credit for the uh, Kittredge deal. Kenneth likes the quote that I had on Twitter. Fifth inning redacted. We're just not talking about it. We're not talking about it. Thoughts on bullpen management. Allison's asking about the management of the bullpen. Uh, look, anytime anybody gives up a home run and he's a relief pitcher. Sorry, I keep having to itch my nose. People are going to say that Ollie made the wrong move, that he shouldn't have brought that guy in because he homered. Well, great. Thank you for that insight that happened directly after the play happened. If you were saying it at the time, fine, good job. You called your shot. That's okay. There are times where that's going to happen. But, and Trevor, sorry if the video's choppy, brother. I can't do a thing about it. Um, and Craig says, nah, bro, get paid. Um, and by the way, lots of comments. I will try to get to them all. There is one way to guarantee I see your comment. Super chat's available to you. I'm not, you don't have to do it, but if you really have a question, like if this jerk doesn't answer my question, I'll lose it. That would be the way to get it in um, because it shows up in like bright colors on my screen. As far as bullpen management, I think it's great because you had the off day on Thursday and you're coming into a game where you got to win the sucker and you you scored six runs and Ollie Marmel knows that. And he's like, no, we're going for the jugular. We're not going to put ourselves into a situation where we score six runs. Arnado finally hits a dang homer and you're going to allow the, the the pitching staff to kind of blow this by using anybody but your aces in the hole when you can line it up six, seven, eight, nine. 
I get it that Gallegos was was the guy you brought into the fifth and it didn't work out to, to get that final out the way you wanted. However, got him in the sixth, and then from there you used your dudes. Though that's that's the way you line it up. And credit to Ollie, man, because he again, you could go and say, Well, let's kinda let's kinda dink around here and maybe you go with with somebody from the B tier and try to get your get yourself to the, the late innings because you don't want to burn. Nope. You had everybody available and rested. You use them. You win a game. Um, I get it. Like, here's the thing. People don't really like, they always point to Ollie in the, the 2022 playoff series, and they say he managed to pitching terribly that day. People don't like it when I say this. That day against the Phillies was one of the best managed games that Ollie Marmel has ever had. Until the moment, and it wasn't even bringing Helsley in in the eighth. It wasn't even sending him back out for the ninth. They had no reason to believe anymore because they trust their players. They talked to the guy that Ryan Helsley was going to have an issue with his finger on that day and that it was going to get numb because it was a little chilly and he had sat and then he was back out for the next inning. The point at which, like, you could you could really pinpoint in that game in that inning where it started to get away from Helsley and the Cardinals that maybe one batter sooner he should have sent out the pitching coach or he should have recognized, like, it's going off the rails for Helsley. We need to pull the emergency stop but I'll never forget like the next day in his office there was a long conversation about this and he said look was that an option yeah we could have done that but then am I tossing and turning any differently than I did tonight going away from my guy that had a one ERA for the year the thought process being we're just going to ride this out with the guy who got us here and the guy that is the best reliever in baseball this year and his finger's a little effed right now, and it is what it is. I know that's a hard thing for people to accept. I know that there are a lot of people who will hold that against Sully Marmel forever. Personally, I think it's one of the best managed games he's ever had, and they just they 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 drew a bad hand. They had some bad luck. Tonight was an example of good bullpen management. Really weird fifth innings, especially defensively. Yeah, Grave of Einstein, what's up, my man? It uh, it happens, and that's why I said it's redacted. It's redacted, so we're good. Uh, Chris says Gia was killing him, but best win of the year. Everybody picked up everybody. A game like this gives you hope. Go Cardinals. Yeah, I think that's fair, Chris. And I like the positivity on the stream. It's always good. Um, Austin says, if y'all don't like the stream, <laughs> I think that was a veiled threat. Yeah, we got 29 likes. That's Chris Carpenter. We can certainly get it to what Lance Lynn's coming up next. And then, uh, Brandon Crawford coming up pretty soon. 35. We can get it to Brandon Crawford. Uh, yeah, so keep it going. Keep it going. Gio is in the sixth inning guy until further notice. Uh, JK, Gino's homer barely made it out. Yep. Um, yeah, Gio is going to be able to throw in any inning. He, he gives up homers. He does sometimes give up homers. It happened to him last year. He's kind of having it happen to him again. Execution. Sometimes they hit a good pitch out. Sometimes he didn't execute enough. In that spot, they really could have used him to bury those pitches and, and have been a little more careful. But you know what? It's interesting that it set up the opportunity for the Cardinals to have the game that they had and show a little bit of fight. Um, Chris W., I got multiple Chris's in here, so I'll try to specify, says, happy for Victor, and Mason is going to be right there for Rookie of the Year. That would be something, guys. That would be something if Mason Wynn was in the running for Rookie of the Year because, remember, the Cardinals did what they needed to do to make sure they get a draft pick as a result of that. So keep an eye on that. I think the OPS would need to be higher, but he's hitting over 300. He's got 800 OPS. And there's a world in which he can dial it in and, and be a candidate for a gold glove too. And and so keep an eye on Mason. I'm going to read official PJ's comment in a moment because he, uh, he gave me a little money, which I really appreciate PJ. Thank you. All right. Super chat. Here's a deal. If you had to guess, will Tink be in the rotation opening day next year? Tink hence eight strikeouts tonight. I believe it was, what was it? Five shutout innings. For the old Springfield Cardinals, this is a big year for Tink Hens. Will he be in the opening day rotation? I'm going to say no. Will he be seen in 2025 in the big leagues if 2024 goes well, health-wise goes well, progression-wise, 100%. He'll be up by next year. It's not impossible, pending whatever happens injury-wise, how this team, it's not impossible you'd see him this year. I mean, if he goes five innings, three runs, uh, pardon me, three hits, one run, no walks, and eight Ks every time he pitches, you're going to see him in 2024. Now, that's, that's, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. The Cardinals are going to take their time with him for sure. But 
I think you got to like what you're seeing, and the Cardinals need to see more of it. They want to see innings from this guy. He needs to clear 100 innings, maybe 110, maybe a little more. I feel like that's something that probably needs to take place in order to have some confidence that you can pencil him in for next year. And pencil just means, hey, write his name in the periphery of the rotation. Like, would you go into the offseason and make a make a statement of, we're not signing back some of these guys because we want to leave a spot open for Tink. No, but I think spring training 2025 will be massive for Tink Hens, especially if he has a good year this year. Maybe he probably gets to AAA during this year. Maybe he's knocking on the door of the big leagues. And then it's like, okay, show us against big leaguers. Do it in spring. They're going to give him a long look if 2024 ends up being like a rocket ship for his value. So, yeah, that's a great question, PJ. And thank you for your first super chat. YouTube told me that's your first one you've ever done. It means a lot that you do that for me. I think it's a great question. I think it's just a matter of let's see the innings first. We need to see a full year of Tink. How many innings does he throw? How many innings does that allow the Cardinals to project that he'll throw next year? And then they can start penciling in what his workload could be in a big league capacity. But wouldn't it be great that we talk about these Cardinal pitchers, Jordan Hicks, goes to the Giants to become a starter, and now he looks really good. Cardinals really never gave him that full runway to be a starter. I know there were a couple times where they did, but it was kind of like haphazard, like, eh, we probably should do this because he wants it. Ryan Helsley's the closer, and he's awesome, right? But he never really failed as a minor league starter. Jordan Hicks certainly never failed as a minor league starter. A lot of times, the philosophy back in the, you know, Carlos Martinez days, Wayno days, Lance Lynn days, you know, Dakota Hudson... Until you really failed as a starter, they weren't going to make you a reliever. But the caveat to that is if you throw 100, Trevor Trevor Rosenthal threw 100, you don't get to be a starter, right? So do you regret that a little bit if you're the Cardinals? I don't know. Tink Hens is kind of a dynamic arm where everybody's like, hey, what's he going to be? But he hasn't thrown a bunch of innings. They've taken it really easily. You could see the Cardinals just falling back into their old ways and going, hey, we just need this arm. Let's get him up. He's a reliever. They're not going to do that, I don't think, with Tink Hens because they know that it's these opportunities to make something happen and maybe get a dynamic arm on the major league minimum for a few years in that rotation. It's too valuable of an opportunity. But it's a big year for Tink Hens. It really is. Uh, Trevor, <laughs> Trevor, you're an SLB for this comment, but your your super chat is much appreciated, brother. He says he's donating to the PlayStation 5 fund so that I'll play some MLB The Show on the live streams. And thanks for the late-night entertainment. Thank you, Trevor. Here's what I'll say about that. I do, I am trying to consider, got to still kind of talk my wife into it, but I want to get a PS5 to play the show. And my thought is, like, these video game streamers, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong about this in the comments, but it's crazy. Like, I'll just sit there on TikTok sometimes, and there's this dude, and you guys might even know who I'm talking about, but he'll just sit there and count up on the stream until he hits an inside-the-park home run on MLB The Show. Like, he picks a stadium and tries to hit an inside-the-parker. I don't know if that was like a, maybe that was a mode on the show recently, and that's why he's doing it, or he's just doing it because it's some idle stuff that people will scroll through and watch. You sit there and watch it for like 15 minutes, you go, I've just been watching this dude fail and get mad for 15 minutes. But my thought would be, I could just answer baseball questions and riff about like what's going on with the Cardinals, what's going on around MLB, And so it's almost like these live streams, except for you're not looking at my ugly mug. You're watching, you know, at least watching some baseball video games and stuff. I think there could be a really, really fun dynamic with that. Let me know if you'd watch that. Let me know if that's something I should really incorporate to the channel. I've been talking about the channel a lot recently because I don't want to make people, I don't want to make people upset. Like I subscribe for Cardinals content only. And I don't, it's like, well, you know, Jordan Montgomery firing Scott Boris the other day was interesting. Ipe Mizuhara is interesting and it's a, it's topical. So I riffed 40 minutes on Thursday night about it. Like that kind of stuff is going to happen on the channel more. As long as folks are not like getting on me and saying they're going to just revolt. I'm kind of trying to get creative so we can build this thing up. So thank you all for, for watching for sure. Uh, Click like we're up to 37. What's the next benchmark? Trying to think of another number. Yadier Molina as a, as a young player was number 41. We got to get it up to 41. Jeff says, So easily could have folded kudos for not doing so. Cardinals do deserve some kudos tonight, man. How many of y'all saw that fifth inning and it was like, uh uh-oh, yep, (laughs) here we go. But it didn't end up going that way. The Cardinals were able to to make something of themselves and win this game 9-6. Alex says the Lars bomb was his favorite moment. That's right. I mean, he and Arnado both nuked them. They nuked their home runs. 
Uh, scrolling down, Morgan, what's up? We've got to start singing the praise of the Mason win. He's been so important. He's been so good. I saw a stat on, like, the outs above average defensively that actually had him as a negative so far. Whatever, dude. Like, Mason Wynn's played good defense. He had a throw that he sailed a little bit tonight. It didn't cost him. He, he is really important. And, again, the Cardinals showed faith in him. We talk about all the things the Cardinals do wrong when we're kind of we're chirping them, but the Cardinals showed faith by saying, look, this is our shortstop coming in. I know he hit 148 last year or whatever it was. He is the guy. There's no competition. How often historically have we seen that from the St. Louis Cardinals where they say, hey, this guy who has not performed at the big league level, we're going to bring him into the season as our shortstop, and there is no fallback. There isn't one. Like, yeah, you signed Brandon Crawford because he's not going to play a ton. Like, that's the whole reason he was the guy that was brought in because he's not going to play a ton, and he was cool with that at this point in his career. That's rare, and yet it's paying off for them so far. He looks really ready, and he looks legit. Um, thank you guys for watching this stream. Thank you guys for commenting and, of course, subscribing. Travis says most notable was Goldie and Arenado looking comfy at the plate. Goldie's swing was really big. That was the RBI. He did only That was the only hit he had, but I do agree there's a different comfort factor. Um, Ilyu says Arenado's swing is coming along. Hitting the ball hard. The at-bat where he had the the late inning hit. I can't remember if it was a single or a double, but he pulled it. Everything was getting pulled. He pulled like three or four foul balls in a row, and you're just like, this dude's right on it. He's about to he's about to do it again. And then had the base hit to left. That is what Nolan looks like. But it, he's been doing a little bit of that recently, right? I think he's still on the hit streak. The problem was he wasn't doing it for power until he got out to Arizona, and it's like, oh, yeah, I used to play against these guys all the time with Colorado, and I don't like them. Gone. Like, I again, I said it on some podcast. I don't remember which one. If anybody has said in the comments, let me know. But I can't remember. I want to gloat. I want to say, see, I told you so. I just can't remember where I said it to go find the clip. Uh, Travis wants to see the bats still rolling tomorrow against another mid-starting pitcher. I know Gallon goes on Sunday. Who pitches tomorrow for the old D-backs? You don't have to comment. I'm looking it up. Relax. Everybody calm down. I'm going to look it up. I had it in my head earlier today. Oh, it's Nelson. Well, yeah, Nelson's got an 8 2 2 ERA, right? Nelson. So, uh, Gibby and Nelson tomorrow. What time's that game, by the way? Who's got a time? 8 10 Eastern, 7 10 Central. On Disney Channel. No, not really. Um, Allison, how do they keep the momentum going tomorrow? Well, they get to Ryan Nelson, first of all. 8 2 2 ERA. I think that would be the way to do that. They just got to keep hitting. And Gibby just needs to go six and four, six and three. You know, that's all they really need from Gibson. Um, nice way to announce the presence for Newt. Hopefully he can stay on the field. Where do y'all want Newt to bat? Put that in the comments below too. I want to know where Cardinals fans want him to bat in the order because I think anywhere in the top six is is feasible. But, man, I think number two would be a nice spot for him. But I also understand that kind of messes up the left, right, left, right stuff. Um, Rosario wants uh, Arnado to ditch the two-handed swing, go back to the one-handed and high finish. I think we saw a little bit of that tonight. Um, Trevor, Nada was a guy that one game is really all it takes for him to turn the corner. Team needs this game to be that corner. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. A lot of folks chiming in about Nada's swing, that it looks better. Yeah, it looks better when you go three for five and you hit a nuke. What was the distance on that Arnado home run, by the way? I keep asking these rhetorical questions as though I'm going to see the comments right away. I The thing with this stream, too, and if you're listening on Spotify or listening on YouTube the next day and I made it audio only so you don't care, I'm sorry for talking so much about the YouTube stream, but a lot of folks in the live chat are, you know, it's relevant to them. I um, I, I can't, like, I have to do the settings to see, okay, they'll be able to see my video decently clearly, but the comments are on a big time delay. Like, those are always the tough decisions that I got to make. 425 for Nolan. 438 for Newt Bar. My gosh, I knew it was a nuke, but that's crazy that it was 13 feet farther than uh, than Nolan's. I don't think I would have had that. I do not think I would have, like, if I would have just blind guessed it, I don't think I would have had Newt Bar's being 13 feet further. And I was watching with the volume off when that was going on. Um, everybody should send out a congratulations, by the way, to Benjamin Hockman at Hockman on Twitter. Got inducted into his high school's Hall of Fame tonight, Clayton High School. It was really, really cool. Uh, just a great dude, very deserving. So give him some props tonight as well if you want to give Hockman some love on Twitter and tell, get, throw him a congrats. He deserves it. Uh, Eric, appreciate it, brother. That's really nice of you to do the Super Chat. Uh, great win tonight. Eric really thinks that when Middleton comes back, they'll have one of the best pens in baseball. 
And I'm very, I'm growing uncomfortable with <laughs> this being the PS5 fun. But no, I do appreciate you guys, uh, you giving me some love. Um, I really think, like, let's let's dive in for a moment on Keenan Middleton. I do want to get to everybody else's comments, so I try to do a combo of jumping through them rather quickly, but also when I think there's something that we need to riff on, spend in a moment to do so. And be, people are being so good right now. I'm not going to bother with adding any extra ads. If you get an ad, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to click to give you any extra ones um, because people are making this worth the while. He had the 1.88 ERA last year after being traded from the White Sox. We're talking about Keenan Middleton. Remember, he was the dude that that whole White Sox clubhouse, there were some questions, the leadership, and Keenan was as outspoken as anyone after the trade saying it, that there was just no authority there. There was nobody really kind of tying that clubhouse in to be able to say, hey, here's the way it needs to go. And not a glowing endorsement of Pedro Grifal, who's the White Sox manager, still the White Sox manager, but I don't know if he will be after this year. That's just one of those things where it's like, okay, interesting. The Cardinals had all this talk about veteran leadership, and then they get a dude who was very outspoken coming from a place where he said, that didn't look like it needed to look, and I want to go somewhere where I could be an agent for change. Well, then he went really, really good with the Yankees in uh, 14 innings, 17 strikeouts with a sub-2 ERA. So I'm not saying he's going to have a sub-2 ERA, but even if he's a 3.38 ERA, which is what he was in, in totality last year between Chicago and New York, Add that to the bullpen. Is he your fifth best reliever, your fourth best reliever at those numbers? Like that could end up being something really, really notable where this bullpen as, as solid as we think it can be right now, that really makes it a completely different animal. And I'm curious to see what it's going to look like if, and when he can get back and don't forget Riley either. I don't know if Riley O'Brien is like on the way back. I know they, they got semi encouraging news on him. Now, when they say it's encouraging, how encouraging is it really? We don't really know until we see him ramp back up, but that's another guy that I, the bullpen's got a chance to be really good. It's easy to say after a night where the bullpen looks fantastic, but I do think there is some validity to it. Um, we got to get up to Gibby here. I'm not talking about Kyle Gibson, 44. I'm talking about Bob Gibson, 45. Well, we got like number 44. Um, Wayno is probably next up after Gibby to get it to 50. I'm, if I'm skipping over your favorite player, we could go Yvonne Herrera, 48. I'm not really a great numbers guy. There are some people who are like locked in on what all the numbers are. It takes me a moment sometimes with some of the guy's numbers. Willie, McG Willie McGee, 51. We could probably get there before I talk about the, the lag counter again. Uh, Cardinal Squad says Mason's in the ROY convo. I think he probably would be. Um, pro I, I won't probably have anything to do with that. Last year, I did get a vote for ROY, um, but Corbin Carroll was kind of the runaway option, and, and he is who I voted for first place. But Mason Wynn, I mean, with these numbers, you're going to have to consider some of the other guys that that if they end up with a higher OPS, because I do value OPS, it means you're getting on base and slugging and 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 doing all the things that, that matter offensively. But again, defense, I think, should factor into that too. So we'll see how Mason is able to establish. It's hurt, It's going to hurt him too to bat in the, the, the lower half of the lineup so consistently because there's going to be some guys for teams that probably are, are batting up a little higher. But nevertheless, I think Mason certainly is off to a start that um, he's got to be considered in that realm for sure. Um, uh, PJ also adding that Victor had some good swings today. Yes, he looked very, very solid at the plate. Uh, Drew P, I won't read your last name, Drew. Uh, he just says, go Cardinals. Um, Brandon Fart would be the comment from the grave of Einstein. We are really going off the rails now between Drew P and, uh, again, not going to read the last name, and the grave of Einstein with his comment. Um, you know, Brandon Fott's a good pitcher, but he's, I think he I think he kind of showed up in the playoffs last year and maybe pitched above his head for a little while. And now you're, you know, you're seeing him come back down to earth a little bit. Uh Romero Kittridge Helsley shut down. More commenting from Chris about Middleton. He can become a force. Robbie says, B Shave, saw your tweet about the bounce back and 100 percent agree. Why send Victor down once the damage has already been done? Sunk cost fallacy. Might as well give him another shot. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly the, the sunk cost. I, I understand your point where it's like, you're not going to, what are you gaining by punishing him for what he did on Wednesday, right? Because do you think he's going to do that again? Or are you, are you regular? <laughs> like, do you recognize that that was a game that was just a bad one? And he's not going to be that guy that struggles defensively every game and is going to make base running mistakes. I'll bet he doesn't do that left turn thing at, at first base, maybe for the, re I'm not going to say the rest of his career, but I, I bet he doesn't do it again this year. I, I, that's a rarity. And it's probably something that sticks in your mind when you mess up in that way. And it did end up being a run that would have tied the game. So he's going to remember that. He said, look, I'm going to make mistakes, but I, I'm going to learn from them. 
That's what Victor said after the game. And that's veteran savvy coming from a from a 23-year-old rookie right there. Uh, Trevor says one for three from VS2. That'll raise the average. Yeah, he's up over 100, which is it's not nothing. Uh, Corn, what's going on, man? You're in here. Was uh, in the middle of the uh, assembly a table, as one does, of course. Finished right before finding out it won't fit in the spot we wanted it. Right as Geo gave up a dong, I was absolutely crapping myself mad. Yeah, see, that was down bad, but at least you got to eventually watch a Cardinal winner. You eventually got to watch some B-Shape Daily Live, so life's good for you now, Corn. I have to figure. Um, and he says, go Birds, so good win. Hope you, hope you the, the, the whole table thing. I hope that works out for you, buddy. Um, if I miss your comment, just comment again. I'm scrolling a little bit faster because I don't want to get hung up on too many things, and then people are listening the next day. I know people love this stuff, but I want to make sure to try to try to get to everybody. Rena says 23 cards would have lost this game. Encouraging to see them fight back. I would agree with that. A lot of a few folks have made that comment, and I think it's a fair one. So I'm I'm on board with that. Um, I've nuked it right to the end of the comment thread, so I have to scroll back up and, and let this repopulate a little bit. Uh, da, 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 da. Craig wants to know why Cardinal fans dunk on Mo. Doesn't every GM have misses? Would you consider him a great compared to others? I'd say his resume is great. I, I mean, if you would tell me that Mo doesn't have a great resume, I would think you're lying to yourself. He's got to be one of the longest tenured uh, president of baseball ops or GMs or just head baseball execs in in the majors. He's had one losing season. He's had, yeah, his resume is undeniable. Now, could you make a case that modern last handful of years, there are some things about their organizational philosophies and approach that need to be shifted to modernize? 100%. I think the, I think both of those things can be true. Um I think Cardinals fans so dunk on Mo because they are passionate and the Cardinals haven't won a World Series in 12 years, 13 years. I mean, can it just be that simple? There's been a little bit of a steady decline where the Cardinals fans of the mid, you know, 20 teens, early 20 teens were used to going to the NLCS every year. And then it's like, you go every once in a while, you might miss the playoffs a few times. It's just, it's just expectations are high. And so I think it gets easy to dunk on the guy that it's also just like, what's the phrase for when you just get tired of something because he's been around so long. Like you just, you just kind of get sick of him. And that's that would happen to anybody in that role. I don't think that's exclusive to Mo. It's just familiarity breeds contempt. That's the phrase. I think there's another way to say that, but that's kind of it. it it's just, you know, the more familiar, the guy's just been so synonymous. And then it's like, all right, I'm tired of hearing this guy talk about, is he, is he making an excuse? Like, all right, come on. I think that just kind of gets to be a narrative, fair or unfair. And so that's, I think, where some of that comes from when, when fans give Mo a hard time. Is some of it fair criticism? Yes. Is a lot of it over the line? Well, it depends on how they're framing it. I think you always want to be respectful. But is some of it just kind of bred from having high expectations and those expectations not being met consistently enough recently and he's the guy in charge? Yeah, I think that's also probably a bit of what's going on. Kenneth says, I know it's completely off topic, but how does Brandon Belt not have a job? He had an 858 OPS last year. Yeah, I don't know. If you would have asked me in like a blind taste test, that's not the word. If you would have just asked me, I would have figured he was on the Giants right now. I just, I don't know. Uh, well, he wasn't even on the Giants last year. He was on Toronto. And yeah, played almost, I mean, he played 100 games. That is weird, dude. I don't have an answer for that one. See, I like it when people make me think, because I wouldn't have known that he wasn't in the league right now. Brian says that Scott had some good ABs, productive ABs, look more confident at the dish today. Everyone in the lineup got a hit. Even <laughs> Brian said, even our Joey Gallo. I don't know what that means. Is that is that a Gorman reference? What are we doing? And then the comment, uh, Matt's must shut down after 70 pitches. Yeah. He, he looks good at the beginning of these games, doesn't he? Uh, struggling in the majors for Victor is going to pay off in the long term. Yeah, I, I think there's a level of struggle that you can be glad he went through. You don't want him batting sub 100 for too long, Cardinals fans, but there's also a level. And Corn also added he's going to pop a homer soon. And if he does, Twitter is going to be a fun place to be on that night. People are going to be very, very hype if he. And honestly, I agree with Corn. Like you look at his swing. I know I predicted the breakout for Arenado. Kind of again. If anybody can can tell me where that was, I want to clip it off and and brag. But uh, when a guy doesn't homer 
Although there was one dude, I forget who it was. You guys probably saw it. One dude on Twitter who said, I'm not tweeting again until Arenado homers. And he sent it at like 1 p.m. today. <laughs> and so once the homer happened, I replied and said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm glad to see you back. That must have been real tough for you. Like six hours without a tweet. But yeah, I um, I think you could see Victor. I, I was going to decide on going out on a limb and what I predict him to homer in Arizona. Something about Arizona, man. Sometimes the roof's open, the ball's flying, you can close the roof, and they've got the, what's it called, the humidifier, and the ball's still flying. Like, I don't know. I know it's called the humidor. Anyway, I think he's got a swing that he might get into one soon. I'm not going to go on. I'm not going to go as far as to say it'll happen in this series, but if it does, remember that we had this conversation. Uh, Helsley on a pace for 50 saves. People are going to feel so stupid for ripping Ryan Helsley. That's my prediction for this year. End of the year is going to come, and you're going to look up at his numbers and go, holy bleep, that guy is legit. And he's going to get paid. There's a world in which the Cardinals should consider. <laughs> they should. I mean, if I'm healthy, I'm telling them, like, let's just wait till the end of the year. And I can show you <laughs> I can show you what's about to happen. But there's there might be a world in which Ryan, a Ryan Helsley extension wouldn't be crazy. And I know. My my next word out of my mouth is going to be don't do it because relievers, pitchers in general, typically break down. But, I mean, he's looking really, really good. I think he's going to have a great year. Geo is nasty, but he don't. But he do be giving up homers. Yeah, that's kind of it. He either gives up a homer or he shuts you down. O'Brien, another guy to the example of trading for relievers, hasn't been healthy yet, but I think he will be good. Trevor, I agree. Um, we only saw him in that one game on opening day, and it was just very clear that he was nervous. The stuff was pretty electric. He just couldn't control it. And maybe part of that was because of the, you know, the injury. Maybe it was just nerves, and then that led to the injury. Who knows? They were on Geo's slider today, even in the sixth. Good on him to get out of it. Yeah, I'm not going to bring up the thought. I was talking to Jeff Jones the other day. I feel like Geo's slider has a big vertical break, but maybe it's being classified as another pitch. Um, one of the one of the pitch shape people that really knows their stuff, send me a DM on Twitter. What do you know about Geo's slider? Because we were looking that up, and it was like it, it was not grading that way on StatCast, and I didn't have time to look into it any further. But if anybody's like really into that kind of stuff, I'm like casually into it because I I got to know some of these things. But I'm also it's not like where I live on the on the StatCast boards and stuff like that. So what do you think on on Geo Slider? Einstein, hit me up in a DM. Give me give me your dissertation because I know you know your stuff. Uh, what do you think? Oh, we already answered that one from Craig about Mo getting dunked on. How about Matt's? Obviously didn't end great, but he has looked a lot better. Yeah, I think it's like a tough thing to say, throw a guy four innings and then get him out of there before, you know, before it gets bad. Matt's ideally can get you through five. He never needs to go into the sixth. If he goes five every time and gives up one or two, your love in life, but you know, obviously some things happened in the fifth today redacted. We don't talk about it, but yeah, I think Matt's in general, I think in general, you can feel decent about where he's at. Just keep him healthy though, too. Uh, Romero Burleson didn't play, still pounded the ball. Um, Chris, I don't really know what that means. Romero and Burleson Romero did play anyway. Um, and they overcame adversity. Yep. I feel far better about this team than 2023. Yep, they're back to 500, which is good, too. Um, Trevor Trevor said taking Quintana out. I know this was about the 2022 playoffs. Uh, before the third time through was fine. It's something they decided before the game started. And I know people would say, use your eyes, Ollie. But in a playoff game, like, I don't mind you mapping out your relief pitching. And then when you get the result you were looking for, and it's exactly to a T what you had planned, I don't mind doing that. I don't mind saying, all right, let's 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 go to the next stage of this plan. Yeah, I loved taking Quintana out when they did. I'll go to my grave feeling that way because I literally asked Ali Marmel before the game about it. I'm like, what do you think about third time through? This is a play. I knew going into the game what he was going to do. It was just one of those things that it didn't work out because of the way it ended in the ninth inning. But we don't need to make it negative today. Cardinals fans are feeling good. I didn't need, I didn't mean to open up old wounds. Um. Chris is speculating on why Mo gets a lot of heat. Um, the word arrogant and then another word was thrown in there. And I get it. I think Mo even knows that he's kind of, that there are people who feel that way about him. It's hard. I would just say it's really hard to be in that role and not have somebody somewhere thinking you're arrogant, you know? 
Michael says good team win. Chris is heading out. Good night, Chris. Uh, Sober. Explain who Hence is and what he brings, please. Okay. So in the 2020 draft, the Cardinals went a little bit of a different way than they normally do in the draft because that was the COVID year and there was no college baseball. They're typically drafting a lot of collegiate pitchers. And they still did get one. Ian Bedell, I think, was that year out of Mizzou. He's still in the org. But they also went a little bit different and said, we got an opportunity to get some really high upside kids, and they're out of high school. Jordan Walker, Mason Wynn, and Tink Hentz, all part of that 2020 class, all out of high school. So it's a little bit early to be able to figure exactly what he's going to be because he was a pretty skinny kid coming out. He's still not a, a big dude, but he's put some some muscle on. and. He hasn't thrown a ton of innings yet in the minors. He's been very, very slowly brought along. I'll pull up Tink's stats so that I can give you guys the info. And uh, unlike last year, I'm not going to be able to, eventually I'll be able to figure out like streaming. I'm going to put, you know, the baseball reference page up on the screen when I'm, when I'm looking at it. But for tonight, I'm just going to read it to you. Um, 2021, he pitched a little bit in rookie ball, eight innings. 2022, a ball through 52 innings. Last year, he got up to 96 total innings between Peoria and Springfield. So, Mo said in the dugout on the home opener, like, somebody asked him, 100 innings for Hans? He said, oh, yeah, we think that needs to be. I think they really need to push him to about 110, 115. That'd be ideal. You don't want to go crazy from 96 and jump up to 140 or anything like that. But I do think there's something to be said for, let's just, you know, put a little more stress on this guy. He's only 21, 22 years old. Let me see when he turns 22. Um, not till August. So he's 21 years old. He's in double a, this is just that year where I think if he makes a leap, you can start to talk about what his MLB trajectory is, but what he brings is dynamic stuff. He had eight strikeouts today, uh, in five innings for Springfield, didn't walk anybody and gave up a run. This, this could be a big summer for Tink Hens, And we could finally have the answer to the question on the, on the behalf of the Cardinals, which is like, what are they, when are they going to develop a starter that they can end up putting into the rotation plug somebody in, and suddenly, boom, you've got a guy that you feel like 750000 or whatever the MLB minimum will be at that point in time, you've got a guy that you don't have to sign an $11 million Kyle Gibson. No no affront to Kyle Gibson. I'm all about Gibby. But when the Cardinals have to get two or three of those guys every year, whether it's in the offseason or at the deadline, that puts you into a position that suddenly you're going, this is not like the optimal way to to build a rotation. If you have a team Kent's that, and this isn't going to be a slight on, on Zach Thompson, but right now, how do you view Zach? He's kind of that number six that can be your number five. If, if you're in a pinch, right? He hasn't necessarily proven that he's going to be a top end rotation arm. You can see the potential there, especially if he can start to get the velocity back up. I think that's another element of it for Zach Thompson. That's just like, yeah, you, you know, it, it, that's the next step in the in in the process for Zach Thompson as my hair starts to do a little weird thing at the front of my hat. We're just going to let it happen. Um, right now, he's he's dealing with some mechanical stuff, and so he's not throwing 95 like he used to could. If Zach Thompson can get there, maybe he can be a number two. But, like, they haven't had that guy who they develop him. He's up, and he's not a number five just sneaking in. He's your number two. Like, he's legit near the top of the rotation arm. The Cardinals, it's been a little bit since they've been able to have that. Give me one moment, folks. Sorry about that. So they are really looking for that guy to be able to sort of round out their rotation. I'm going to fix this, too, because it's bothering the crap out of me. If you're just watching it on, uh, watching this video audio-wise the next day, it's just that one freaking hair. This is going to be like, this is going to be an all-timer of people going, why is he messing with his hair? I almost said a bad word. Um so they need to have somebody developed. That's the that's the name of the game for this rotation. Somebody internally develop someone, and then you can build around. And when a Jordan Montgomery opportunity comes up, suddenly you're able to take advantage of it rather than going, well, we did have to spend on our four and our five, and we had to buy a one. Having the ability to develop one of these dudes would be massive. Tink could be that guy. Could be that answer. Uh, PJ uh, has, has jumped back in on Super Chat, brother. You didn't have to do that. I really appreciate you. Chase Davis has been raking. He went back to his old swing. What do you think of him? Uh, you post the most frequent out of any cards page. Keep up the good work. Yeah, man. I'm B shave daily is what I named my podcast. And I went back, I've been doing this for like four years and only have been doing YouTube since last April, but it's been on Spotify for a long time. By the way, you guys, if you're listening on YouTube, 
If you subscribe on Spotify, just search Be Shafe Daily if you have Spotify. It's okay if you don't listen there, but it does help me out if you subscribe there too. Um, that would that would be great. Chase Davis, I was really, really pumped when the Cardinals drafted him. I thought it was a nice, a nice pick of an outfielder with with some tools and some upside. I did also think that Hurston Waldrop would have been a really good pick in that draft. Um if you were going to go pitcher and I haven't checked in on what he's been doing for the Braves. And then of course, when the Braves end up drafting him, you're like, Oh, well, of course, like, you know, it's probably a superstar because the Braves know what they're doing. But that, that was the kind of arm that I thought, yeah, if you're worried about not being able to develop somebody, maybe figure it out. As I look, Hurston Waldrop has had one appearance in double a and his ERA is 23. So I probably should not have drafted him in a fantasy league. That's, that's neither here nor there. No, I think Chase Davis is interesting. I've seen a lot of talk about kind of changing his swing, going back to his old swing. He struggled at the beginning of last, or I say the beginning. He struggled after he was drafted last year. He went to Palm Beach and had a low OPS, low average. But that's like, you're 21, you're just fresh out. Give him a moment and let's see. Now, he's still at Palm Beach, which you would have hoped to see him at high A by now instead of at Palm Beach. He'll be there soon, though. Through five games, he's got an OPS above 1,000. That's good. He's still striking out quite a bit. There's a long way to go for Chase Davis. Raw talent, but the fact that, like, I look at the age. I do. I know he's out of college, and so a guy that that spent multiple years in college, you want to see him progress rather quickly. And the fact that he's still at Palm Beach, a little bit of a concern, but not really because he just didn't perform last year. Uh, If he can cut down on the strikeouts a little bit, the power is clearly there. He's homered. He's got four doubles in five games. Like, he's, he's going to be at high A before you know it. I think you'd like to see him have a really good, successful season at high A this year, and then from there be able to advance to double A by next year. Like, some of the Cardinal outfielders that they've drafted historically, and I know you guys can probably come up with the names of those kids better than I could. It's like you're excited when they draft them, and then a year goes by and a couple years goes by, and you go, whatever happened to that guy? And then you look, he's still in high A, and you're like, well, damn. Like, it's not going to happen for that kid. Um, I think Chase Davis has a chance. There are some holes that he's going to have to work out. I sound more negative on him than I intended to. Um, it's, it's encouraging to see now that he's hitting for power. Like, great, he's going to pass that test at low A. He's going to go to high A. Keep going in the strikeout thing. You want to at least see some level of, of, you know, those coming down a little bit. Ten strikeouts in five games is a little bit like, oh, okay, wow. But very, very early in his career, I think there's obviously the potential for a bright future. But honing that is going to be important. And I think doing it over the next, you know, 18 to 24 months is also important because you don't want to get too far behind. Um, if it was a high school kid, you're like, all right, he's got some time, whatever. He's 18, 19. He's 22. So you, you want to see that production. And look, he could come up at age 25 and that's just fine. But a lot of guys, you know, by then you don't really think of them as prospects anymore. Um, I'm not trying to put a clock on Chase Davis already. I, I do think he's very interesting. And like I said, when they drafted him, I thought he was a really good get. So we'll see what his season ends up looking like and how far he can maybe uh, progress through the system throughout this year. Um, FF says, didn't you call that Arnado Homer or was it Charlie? No, dude, it was for sure me. And if it was with Charlie, I need to go back and listen to our Thursday episode of Low Hanging Fruit. That's me. That's Charlie Marlowe. You know him from, used to be Fox 2 in St. Louis, uh, Hot Take Central, the radio show that I do with the cat and Cam Jansen on Fridays. Uh, 590 The Fan and 590 thefancom You can check that out 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. on Friday mornings. If you live in St. Louis, it's 590 a.m. If you don't, just go to the website, search Hot Take Central. You'll find it. Uh, you guys all love the cat, Jim Hayes, so you should listen to this show for sure. You should all love Cam Jansen, former Blues Enforcer. is a lot of fun on the air as well. We had a blast. And sometimes we'll I'm able to throw some of those videos on this channel too. So if you see something and you go, that's not really a Cardinals video. That's probably what it is. It's probably from that show. And it's, I have more fun doing that show, man, than I do doing these solo podcasts because I'm talking to people and we're just mixing it up. And it's a little bit more laid back, but it's a lot of fun. So I, I think I uh, would just say y'all give that a chance too if you see those on the YouTube channel at any point. Um, but yeah, I totally did call the R and Homer this, this weekend. I just got to find where it is so I can brag about it. I don't have the clip handy. Corn says he would watch the MLB The Show concept, which is good. Uh, Trevor, we did get to 50 Wayno. Grave of Einstein wants to win the series. We're at 58 likes. I'm thinking, who's next? You go like, wasn't Alex Reyes like 61 for a while? Um, 
Rick Ankeel back in the day was 66, I think. First on. Uh, Corn wants to get to Sotoguchi 99. I would like that. Chase Davis has indeed been rank, uh, raking. Love to see the power. At least if you've got power to offset the strikeouts, it's not that big of a deal. Dodgers loss. Trevor thinks I said it with Charlie about the homer for Arenado. I think that's certainly a possibility. Um, PJ wants to see Newt Barbat third, which I think I, I'm two. I'm either two or three. If you're going to do the left, right, left, right thing, okay, I'd prefer Newt batting third with Gorman dropped a little bit lower. But they don't want to seem to put Wilson lower than five, which would mean the left, right, left, right combo would stop there. It would be through four, and then you'd have right and right at four or five with the lefty six, which is fine if Walker's your, your seven because then you're, you gotta, you got to break it up somewhere. You just have one extra righty. That's that's deserving of batting that high. So, uh, Newt Bar batting third. That's according to Trevor. They want to put yeah. Grave of Einstein says put Newt Bar where Gorman is. Uh, Newt's was like four forty. Yeah, I saw Statcast had four thirty eight on the Newt Bar bomb. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement here. Drew says put Newt in the two spot. I think that's pretty good. Brett, uh, Brett, pardon me, says, do you think the chemistry between Newt and Nado? And then being back together finally contributed to all, uh, both of them hitting bombs. I don't think it's nothing. I don't think it's nothing if a dude's feeling good. I don't know. It's it's probably not everything, but I don't think it's nothing. I think it. I'm all good about the narrative stuff, right? Like I don't have a problem with that. I think there needs to be some vibes going on to have good things happen. Snips says if pitchers can get through six innings with a lead, very confident with JoJo Kit and Hells should be, no doubt. Um, just saw a tweet that says Helsley has pitched in every game the Cardinals have won this season. No freaking way. Although it sounds right. Let me check this out. That's actually really maybe possible. I'm trying to think of it because they've won close games. It's not like they've been blowing teams out of the water in these wins. Today was maybe going to be that day, and then it wasn't. Let me check this out. One, two, three, four, five. Six, and then they won tonight. Seven. I'll be damned. Who had that? That's a great tweet. That's a great pull. I'm glad. I wish I would have thought of it. That's a good tweet. Uh, and and Corin, thank you for bringing that to our attention because that is exactly what happened. He's he's pitching eight total games, and seven of them have been wins. One of them was the Philly game that they lost in uh, in extras because Alec Boehm just hit one over the bag. Again, I thought that was the right process to walk Bryce Harper and. Didn't, didn't end up working out. Chase Davis is indeed the outfield outfielder from Arizona. Wildcat. They took Desiree Reed Francois, but they can have her. No. I As long as Eli Drinkwitz is happy, that's my comment there on, on Mizzou. Just keep Eli good and keep the football team good. And Dennis, let him cook too. Uh, Allison, well, happy birthday. Goodness. She says, thank you for starting off my birthday with this great uh, late night slash early morning live stream. Uh, appreciate it, Allison, and happy birthday. Everybody wish Allison a happy birthday. She deserves it. Um, Clay says, and what's up, Clay? I'm glad to see Clay commenting. I look for the new names. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to the point where we're at an hour. going to start to look for some of the new names. He recommends doing an MLB The Show stream. He's here for it. Happy for the Nado bomb. Mostly so everybody can stop talking about how long it had been. Yeah, August 19th, 2023. I do have the date, and that was even my tweet. I said, it ain't August 19th anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have liftoff for Mr. Arenado. Uh, Korn said, I miss when the cards used to be. Well, of course he's going to be a stud. They know what they're doing, organization. Yeah, that's right now. It's the Rays. It's the Braves. And with hitters, it's the Orioles, dude. I think they've kind of entered into that territory, too. They've got all those young position players that are blonde, and they look like they're all about 18, 19 years old, and some of them actually are. <laughs> they all look the same. It's crazy, but they can hit. Uh, Morgan said, loved you on Locked On Cardinals today. Yeah, I did Locked On with JD. He's a he's a good dude. That was fun. That was fun. I would like to have more people on my channel. It's a, you know, it's a work in progress. We'll get, we'll get around to it. It's tough, man. I'm just, I, I'm at a point where I'm like, let's just make sure we get this podcast out every day. I'll do it at 1 a.m. if I need to, which is literally freaking 1 a.m. You guys should go to bed. But like, that's the, that, we're grinding here. We're grinding. It's different. It's not going to be the same as what everybody else does. JD does a great podcast. And look, I get it. People listen to him. They listen to me. Why not just support one another and cross-promote each other's channels and say, look, 
y'all are Cardinals fans. You'll you'll be willing to watch both of our stuff. We don't have to act like we're we're rivals in this or anything like that. Same with me and Charlie. We do a podcast together weekly uh, for that reason because it's like, look, we might as well all kind of. It's more fun to talk with somebody sometimes than to just talk by yourself. So, um, Morgan mentions the the locked on. Yeah, it's something something that I'd like to do, and maybe get some more people on my channel at times. But like I said, how many people are trying to get on here at one a.m. <laughs> and like JD, I think he's normal and regular, so he's probably posting locked on Cardinals at like two in the afternoon today is when he posted it. We recorded it at like uh, whatever we did, one o'clock. So it was one of those things where like I'm like. I don't even think we're really competing for the listeners. His is going to post off of my time. Mine's going to post at the butt crack of dawn. And so you can watch his whenever you want to. You can watch mine. Like, I think it's good. I think it works out. So, you no, know, he's a good dude. What else is funny, too? And I'm going to ask Jeff Jones if he remembers this. But there was a moment in time where him and I were trying to do, like, Jeff was, like, doing the Locked On Cardinals thing, and I was going to do the podcast with him. And we recorded, like, it, maybe it was just one episode in like the bowels of Bush stadium or something. And then we never spoke of it again. Like I stopped showing up to do it. He stopped asking me to do it and it never happened. And then like a few months later, I was like, all right, I guess I should have done this podcast thing. Let's do B shape daily. And the rest is history. Uh, Garrett says you should go to bed. I certainly should, but it will be, y'all got to understand. It'll be a good 2 AM, 2 30 AM before I get to bed because I have to. Uh, and Garrett says that JD records at random times. Like, that's kind of how I feel about me. My times are either random or middle of the night because I'm able to then, like I said, I'm going to take this, I'm going to cut the audio, post it to Spotify, um, recut the audio, post it to YouTube because I, I don't really love, this is a little bit of a nitpick, I don't really love how YouTube takes, it'll be a, it's like to find it, you have to go to my live tab on my channel. You can't just go to videos to find it. So I actually reposted an audio form uh, with with some of the fluff cut out, and I reposted it to YouTube as well. And I it, it, it kind of hurts my psyche because I look at that video, and it's like they'll tell you the percentage. The analytics are crazy on YouTube. I'll let you all behind the curtain. They'll tell you the percentage of how many people who saw your your thumbnail actually clicked on it. And I did the, the live stream the other day, and I think it was after the Sunday Gray game, and it had never been such a low click percentage. But I think the reason is because you guys all watched it on live. So I was like, all right, chill. Like, don't take it personal. But those kinds, those kind of things could be tough. <laughs> but yeah, Garrett, life happens, bro. And that's why I'm in a spot where I just want to make sure if I call you, my, if I'm some B Shafe Daily, I'm calling it B Shafe Daily, right? I want to give you guys content pretty damn near daily. So if it's at a weird off hour, it's better than not doing it at all. Brian says, listen to you, Charlie and JD Daily. Y'all need to do a group show. Yeah, I need to get StreamYard because both of them have it. They they set up the shows that I did with them, but uh, I don't. I still don't have a StreamYard. I need to get one. Fermin is raking. If Fermin is raking like that, need to get him, uh, bring him up and and get 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 to B Craw. Well, I mean B Craw is going to be here for a minute, but I like that Fermin is raking in AAA because he was always kind of the light hitting infielder. Uh, a one a uh, one thousand one ninety five OPS. There's nothing light about that, is there? Uh, Childish Scarfino said that Josh Baez is a great example of what I was talking about with the outfielders where it's like, who, what happened to that dude? Where'd he go? Hey, didn't they draft that toolsy outfielder? Whatever happened to him? And then you kind of go through it and you go, oh, it never really happened. Or just, it doesn't even always have to be a toolsy guy. LJ Jones. I was like, hey, remember when they drafted LJ Jones and now he's kind of out of the org, just never really took off. Not everybody's going to take off, obviously, but. Yeah, you see some of these guys, and it's just like, oh, yeah, you know, he's going to be the next. And, you know, and Baez is a decent enough example. Now, he was drafted at a high school or whatever it was. I don't remember the way they, yeah, second round in 21. So he's still only 21 years old, but he's at high A and, you know, hasn't really put the numbers together. So the trajectory of his career, something will need to change, change his swing, adjustment here or there, like to be able to get it done. It's going to, you know, it's going to take something like that. For him, um, hope he works out. Don't know much about him, but the swing videos I saw when they drafted him look smooth. I think that was regarding Chase Davis, the uh, the Arizona outfielder. So that's cool. I am going to take a sip of water. I think I've gotten to most of these comments. It's been over an hour. If there's any last parting words, get them to me now. I'm going to take a sip, and then we're gonna we're gonna try to get out of here in just a bit. 
Uh, Craig says, enjoy having someone come on after the games, breaking it all down. Um, look, I'm not going to knock the Bally's post show because they are, they're polished. They, those people know what they're doing. I'm a scrub. Um, I write some things. I talk. I, I'm not polished in the slightest. I appreciate the, the, uh, compliment Craig. I really do, but I'm not going to rip those guys. They do a great job. They really do. Um, now granted I'm not watching right now and I do regret that sometimes I miss something that goes on in the post game. If I'm, if I'm here, but I have, you know, I've decided like, Hey, this is something I am going to pursue this year. It's tough to sometimes put yourself out on a limb because you could look a little bit dumb. What if nobody watches? What if nobody cares? What if you sound stupid? You certainly look stupid. But uh, no, I decided that I'm going to I'm going to give this a shot this year and see how it goes. So you guys uh, watching and supporting makes it makes it cool. Um, she Victor on my Scott till I Homer. I had to read it. I don't know what it is. If it was a euphemism and I'm getting canceled, I'm sorry. But the grave of Einstein gave me two dollars to read that. So I had to do it. Thank you for the super chat, Einstein. Appreciate it. And Brian said that was a Gorman reference. I don't think it's fair to call him the Cardinals' Joey Gallo. Um, I think he'll ultimately have the ability to hit for a higher average than Gallo. I recognize that he's not really doing it yet. Corn is asking if I'm watching the Masters at all. Hope Max Homa pulls it off. Yeah, I did a uh, I did a DFS a daily fantasy lineup for the Masters, and I saw that I think I I might have had a lot of my golfers miss the cut. I'm actually going to look that up right now during the show. No, I'm in fourth in our league, in my in my league. Does anybody know what the cut was? Yeah, son of a B. Sergio Garcia missed the cut. Dunlap missed the cut. I had two of my guys miss the cut, and the other ones made it by a stroke. Matsuyama, what are you doing? You were supposed to be a sleeper pick. How about, uh, okay, in my, in my defense, I don't even know who this guy is. Thorburn Olesen. Out of Denmark. I think he must have just fit in the salary <laughs> requirements because I don't know who that dude is. Uh, but I do have I do have Scotty Scheffler. So that was kind of where I spent all my money on the DFS. I think it was plus six, Corn. unless, yeah, and that could be bad. Because on, on, uh, on the DFS, notice that I'm not saying whether it's on which app because none of them pay me. And so until they do, I don't want to give them the free, uh, the free love. But on the app, it says miscut for Sergio at plus seven. It doesn't say it for Matsuyama or Olesen. So I really hope they made the cut. What was the master's cut? I'm going to type this in real quick. Cut line results. This is really good radio. People like this kind of stuff. People like when you uh, when you Google stuff during the show. It's like Augusta Chronicle. Can you just tell me the number? I just want to know the number. Oh, my gosh, and there's ads. The cut line is six over, so Matsuyama made it. He's got to turn it on. He's got to get it together. Uh, Brian says that I bring a different element to the postgame show. Not too many people covering live after games. Nice you bring fan engagement uh, to the postgame. Yeah, I think that's that's helpful. And look, man, it won't always be the case that I can do it right after the games. Road games, I can a lot more often. Home games, I'm covering, you know, 60 to 70 to 80% of the home games, depending on the year. And depending on, and, and some of them I'm on maybe on a trip with the family or whatever the case might be, but that's the, the kind of the differential there. But I appreciate you guys so much for joining me. For those who joined in the live chat, for those who did the super chat, uh, you you make this worthwhile. I really, really do appreciate it. Make sure to hit like on the video before you get out of here. I think that's all we've got really from the comments perspective. If you made a comment and I missed it, I'm at bshafer12 on Twitter. You can, of course, send me a direct message. I try to get to all of them that I see. Um, this has been a lot of fun, guys. We'll try to do some more throughout this road trip for sure. I don't know that it'll be every day. I can tell you for sure I won't have one Tuesday because I will be out in Jefferson City at the Mizzou Come Home Tour for the uh, the big show on KTGR. I believe the plan is we're going to do a live show there on uh, Tuesday night from 4 to 6, and hopefully we'll be able to come up with some live interviews or some put recorded interviews with Eli Drinkwitz, Dennis Gates, and the like. So, that's Tuesday. I'm going to be a little bit tied up, but uh, we'll get some stuff done the other days this week. Appreciate you guys. As always, as always, hit that subscribe button. Love y'all. We'll talk to you next time on Be Shape Daily. Peace.